Welcome to Grassroots Health presentation of a new series called Conflict in Vitamin D Research. We have had a couple of papers published just in the last few weeks uh, about vitamin D and their basic message is it doesn't do you any good. And today we have with us Dr. Cedric Garland of the University of California, San Diego and the Morris Cancer Center who has been doing research with vitamin D since at least 1980, which is a little over 30 years. And we're going to be talking with him about how he interprets this recent research and what value or how should we look at it. Dr. Garland, thank you so much for coming. Well, thank really you, appreciate Carol. it. Right. Pleasure to be here. On the one article um, by Dr. OTA, what do you see is a couple of the major things that just stood out at you the minute you looked at them? Well, the first thing that stood out is that the study is obsolete. It, it reviews a series of clinical trials over the last 20 years that were done with doses of vitamin D that were so small as to not mean anything. Um, I'll quote my colleague Dr. Bruce Hollis who said about one trial which used 400 units that they gave them no vitamin D and by current standards that's what happened. It's a, such a tiny amount. It's an order of magnitude less than the amount that we would use in a contemporary clinical trial uh, that is being reviewed in these studies. So there are a whole bunch of studies. Most of them are around 400 international units a day of vitamin D. It doesn't specify whether vitamin D2 or vitamin D3, and only vitamin D3 produces the benefit. And um, that's the first part of it. And a second related reaction to it is, is that those studies are the past. There's, they're of no use now. They're, I hate to say it about the work of fellow scientists, including some of them that are mine, but it's garbage in, garbage out. We did not know at the time what the appropriate dose was to produce an extra skeletal effect. You know, that's an effect beyond the bone effect of vitamin D. So we used these little tiny doses, and it was even a battle at that time to use the tiny doses. The study I was affiliated with was going to go with 200 international units, and it took a battle royal to allow the investigators to use 400 international units. What and study was that? That was the Women's Health Initiative. And during that study, the, uh, <laughs> the supplier ran out of vitamin D, so there wasn't any vitamin D in the intervention group for a period of time in some of the preparations. So it, it was, it was their tiny amounts, and m many people in some of those studies probably got no vitamin D at all, or not any, enough to matter. So it, I can't imagine why these authors would take a, a, a whole bunch of totally obsolete studies and combine them in the hope of getting a conclusion that would be of any contemporary use. Mm. So to me, it's just a horrible it's a mistake. It's a you know, blunder of like, gigantic proportions. One of the things that he also did uh, was to reanalyze the LAPI trial and essentially put it into oblivion and say that it didn't matter. The LAPI trial is probably the most important trial in current history uh, of any randomized controlled clinical trial because it shows that taking vitamin D at about 1100 international units per day with 1500 milligrams of calcium gets rid out of, of four-fifths of cancer. Four-fifths of cancer, what else can we do that could possibly get rid of 80% of cancer in one fell swoop. And people just don't want to believe it for some reason. And so they will try to find some form of analysis to extract the meaning from it. But the authors already did the most complicated analyses that were appropriate for such study and found that the findings persisted after the analyses. So it's, it's butchery upon the original paper to do anything other than what the authors reported. And they reported a 80% reduction in the incidence of cancer and uh, highly statistical significant. If you didn't include the first year, and if you include the first year, which we consider a run-in period, then it was a 66% reduction in incidence. But most studies have run-in periods, maybe not as long as a year. But assuming it takes a year for vitamin D and, ca and calcium to produce the benefit, which it well may, then you see an 80% reduction in incidence in, in these serious cancers that included breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, the big killers of Americans. Yet people are trying to act as though this clinical trial does not exist. They're trying to deny its existence. And I'll take it at all as an example. And a strange thing about clinical trials is if you've done a hundred of them that do not find the effect, and then you do one 
using a higher dose that finds the effect, that makes the 100 with a smaller dose obsolete. So it's, it's just absolutely garbage in, garbage out, overwhelmingly um, outrageous form of analysis, and it's beyond me why anyone would do that. One of the things that was not attended to in that study, nor in the other one, um, was common doses and dosing schedules. What impact do you see with dosing schedules? I mean, even if the dose is low, if somebody takes 400 IU a day versus 400,000 IU some other point in time, what, what impact does that have on the well, we analysis? we know from a British study that a big bunch of vitamin D given at one time is a, doesn't work. It, the body metabolizes the vitamin D, and it's not at all equivalent to taking a daily dose of vitamin D. It should never be groups, and our exposure that prevented cancer historically was daily exposure to sunlight. And the idea that we can group it all into a week or group it all into a month isn't right. There's, you know, there metabolism of uh, any compound that gets metabolized, which vitamin D does, it is proportional to the, the size of the dose. So if you give a huge dose at one time, the individual is going to go through it much more quickly than a dose distributed in time. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't taken into account at all in this analysis. And another feature that wasn't taken into account is duration of time. Some of the studies are one or two months, uh, and they're all thrown together, and none of them are of really seriously long duration, as far as I can tell. Um, and it takes a little while for vitamin D and calcium to prevent cancer. It's probably the single most difficult thing for us to do, the single most important scientific question of our era, is how are we going to stop cancer? And it's not going to happen exactly overnight. It's going to take a little while for the uh, micronutrients that prevent it to take effect. And that wasn't taken into account in this analysis either. The other thing that explicitly was not taken into account, I'd like to ask you about as well, is the use of co-nutrients that matter. I mean, those they didn't compare back again to apples and apples and oranges mm -hmm. to oranges. There were a number of studies that had calcium in them and a number that didn't. And yet they didn't say, I'm only together. going to compare these versus well, those. That and was yet, a mistake too, because we know from the Lafayette et al. trial, that calcium enhances the effect of vitamin D. So we, we should be very alert to that. And the new clinical trial at, at Harvard, the vital trial, does not include calcium. Even though the LAPI study clearly showed that calcium potentiated or increased the benefit for vitamin D. And it's in a, in imagine, unimaginable to me why when you have a study that's so wildly successful, when you prevent 80% of cancer, that you wouldn't repeat the same protocol in the next study. Maybe increase the doses, but certainly not leave out one of the two micronutrients that produce that benefit. And the Lapid all analysis shows that there was a, a greater effect of vitamin D if the women received calcium versus the women that didn't. So it's this, you know, it couldn't be more crystal clear that vitamin D prevents cancer and it prevents most of it. It does, acts quickly if Three years is considered quickly, which it is in most disease prevention. And uh, there's no, they could discount all of the studies that ITA reviewed as being now worthless because they didn't use the right dose or they didn't do it for long enough. And um, that's what should have been done. And they should have just said, you know, congratulations to Laffey et al. on doing the definitive study, I would say, uh, of the millennium. It's the study that's going to change the, the picture on cancer. It's ushering us into the golden era of preventing breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, and reducing leukemia in adults, and um, bladder cancer, and kidney cancer, and uh, you know, brain cancer, a whole range of cancers that we know from the same type of ecological studies that got us started on this and led ultimately to studies of individuals for breast cancer, colon cancer, and pancreatic cancer, to uh, the future of studies of individuals finding the same thing. It's in, almost inevitable that that's where it's headed. And uh, so it's just beginning, and the idea that it's coming to an end from the analysis <laughs> of obsolete papers, it's just, it's just Well, I think that maybe, beyond, maybe, maybe that's where we should put it. There's the analysis of the obsolete papers versus today. Versus the today, that's It's changing it very quickly, though. Uh, we were just in um, Omaha, and we met with a gentleman uh, doing a research project um, in the VA hospital 
and they actually are giving 4,000 international units a day. Well, now we're and talking. Yeah. There you go. There you go. I mean, it's, it's finally there, but it's just now. I mean, we're just now doing that. Yeah. We're really not doing that. And when the Hollis Wagner study was done with the pregnancy a few years ago, published in 2010, they gave 4,000 IU to the pregnant women. And they had to jump through all kinds of hoops in order to do that. So this is new. Well, is it new. is. Yeah. In a way, we are empowered in doing it by, of all things, the National Academy of Sciences, which, while they were not very courageous in terms of their recommended daily intakes, mm -hmm. did say that everybody aged nine years and older can take 4,000 international units a day of vitamin D safely. So there's no reason not to do it. It's, you know, they're a very conservative organization. And they even said that 10,000 would be okay if you read the fine print. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's... Uh, it's beyond me why we would even talk about these little tiny doses. It's like, you know, if you broke up an aspirin into a, a tenth the size of the aspirin, you gave it to somebody that had a horrible headache, and it didn't cure the headache, and you'd say, oh, aspirin's useless, you know, you can't use it against headaches, even though you used a tenth of the dose needed to reduce the effect. It's not a perfect analogy, but it's similar to that. And then the author's conclusions that, and, and uh, this is directly responsive to your question, so I had all concluded that the effect of vitamin D was a consequence rather than a cause, that it was the egg, not the chicken. And uh, it, that's another crazy conclusion that could have only occurred to investigators who excluded most of the signs. They reviewed 1,667 papers, and they only looked at about 30 of them, and because the, the other ones were didn't fit their mold of what constituted relevant science, because they weren't clinical trials. Well, if they'd looked at the other papers, they would see that the disease, these diseases are much more common in occurrence and mortality at higher latitudes and that every degree of latitude matters. And the only way that you would get that result, if it were so-called reverse causation, is that people who felt breast cancer coming on and thought they might be getting it, they would have to pack up their stuff, pack up their family, put their family on their back and drive north uh, quite a few degrees of latitude to produce this. And the chance of that happening is so preposterous <laughs> that it's hardly worth entertaining the, the possibility of it. Yet that was the conclusion that they reached. One of the things that was also noted when I read the paper was that they did not show uh, really a comparison of serum levels. I mean, they said, you know, there was no effect, so forth and so on, but based on what? Uh, and since we know that the 25 OHD vitamin D level really is the measure of what we ought to be attaining, what about that piece of missing information? Well, it's a very important piece of information. It, it's unimaginable that they wouldn't have done the analysis, at least separately for studies which reported that, and not grouped them in such a way that it's a mishmash that mm -hmm. is uninterpretable even to a professional scientist working in the field, mm -hmm. let alone people in, in the future or in distant places that are trying to analyze it. Dr. Gerland, there we work with a group of a panel of scientists, vitamin D researchers at Grassroots Health, of which you are a part. And the consensus about what the vitamin D level is ought to be? According to this very serious group of scholars, physicians, and scientists, some of the most skeptical people in the world, the people who work with vitamin D every day of their working life, it should be no less than 40 nanograms per ml. Their absolute consensus, no less than 40 nanograms per ml. And the, the, the Coalition of Scientists recommends a range from 40 to 60 nanograms per ml, meaning that the people who want to get up to 60 have a green light from the consensus of vitamin D scientists. And I think we should be heading in that direction, particularly for women for whom the threat of breast cancer is so high, because breast cancer is a vitamin D deficiency disease. It is due to a deficiency of vitamin D in the same way that scurvy is due to a deficiency of ascorbate or vitamin C, or pellagra is due to a deficiency of, of niacin, or beriberi is due to a deficiency of thiamine. It is absolutely a vitamin D deficiency disease. For men col and women, colon cancer is similarly, absolutely, a vitamin D deficiency disease. It will be completely prevented if the vitamin D levels are, are high enough. So there's no question that we should be at least at 40 nanograms per ml. Dr. Garland, in our first paper that we published with your help out of Grassroots Health, um, 
we showed a dose response curve and that had about 3,000 participants in it. We now have data for about 6,000 participants and one of the things that I wanted to share with our group uh, at this point in time is how much vitamin D does it take to get to 40 nanograms per milliliter. And what we see here is that if you want to um, get 50% of the population, 50%, and only 50%, it takes about 1,300 international units a day to get to that level. If, on the other hand, you want to get about 80%, 80% of the entire population above 40 nanograms per milliliter, you ought to be taking about 5,000 IU a day. But if you really want to make sure, without measuring, and this is a key factor, if you want to make sure that you have as much as 97% of your population with a serum level at 40 nanograms per ml or higher, you need to be taking 10,000 IU a day. And as Dr. Garland mentioned, the 10,000 IU a day was published in the IOM's report as being the no adverse event level. In other words, it was considered safe so far as they knew. Um, doesn't mean that people shouldn't be paying attention to their testing, which we highly recommend all the time to see what your serum level is, because the responsiveness to this varies by a factor of sixfold in anybody's level. We can't tell what the serum level is. But to me, that's exciting news. To get well, 97 is, population, 97%. Lucky that it's in the range regarded as safe by the, yes. the, uh, the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine. Mm -hmm. It could have been that our projections would have led to a dose that people would quibble about. Mm -hmm. But the quibbling is over. They, they spent a year and a half discussing what the safe level was. And it turned out it was 10,000 IU, it was the UL, the upper level uh, intake, considered as safe for most people. And so there is, doesn't need to be more discussion or more quibbling. It's already been approved. Uh, and there's no reason in the world for us not to do it. Uh, it should be done, of course, with monitoring because we never want to go too low or too wildly high. But the key thing is that it's going to take a lot. And it's, for most people, it's probably going to be as 10,000 international units a day, quite likely. Input and is to provide information to all of you viewers and at the same time to give a little bit of guidance as to what you ought to be paying attention to. Hopefully you're paying attention to your serum level and monitoring your intake in order to get you in that safe range, in that healthy range between 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter. So thank you again to each and every one of you for listening in today.